So if you have your Bibles, would you stand with us this morning? And we're going to go to a very familiar scripture. Acts chapter 1, only one verse, verse 8. And it reads, it said, but you shall receive power. Somebody said power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Siberia, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Let's pray, saints. Father, in Jesus' name, dear Lord, we've read your word, O oh God. Now we pray, O oh God, that you will let your word, O oh God, become alive in our hearts, O oh God, and in our spirit. Lord, as we decrease, O oh God, we ask that you allow the Holy Ghost to increase in our midst. Lord, you said we're two or more gathered together in your name. You in our midst. Lord, have your way, O oh God. Let your name be glorified. Touch the hearts of your people, O oh God. In the name of Jesus, let your word become a penetrator in our hearts, O oh God. Lord, that we might realize, O oh God, that, Lord, you came to bless us, O oh God, as we give you praise, as we gather ourselves together in your house, O oh God. Lord, you say you sent your word and you healed everyone that was in the midst, O oh God. Lord, we ask that you would have your way, that your name might be glorified. Save, heal, and deliver. Thy people from their sins, oh God, those that need saving, we'll forever give your name, praise, and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Also, I'd like to remind you that we have service tonight. And for our visitors, those that can make it back, we'll certainly be glad to have you. Um, I can guarantee you'll enjoy your service. You'll enjoy the service tonight. And for the saints of God, we're looking for you to be here. We're expecting our bishop to be in our midst tonight, so we want you to be here and hear what thus saith the Lord. So after we read Acts 1 and 8 said, but you shall receive power. Somebody said power. So our subject for the day is power for the hour. Power for the hour. In other words, the hour that we are living in, you're going to have to be filled with the Holy Ghost to survive in this hour. Do we have any believers in the house this morning? I say in the hour that we are living in, in these last days, you're going to have to be filled, not half filled, not just a little trinkle, but you're going to have to be filled with the Holy Ghost to survive in these last days. Second Timothy 3 and 1 said, this, no, this is Paul writing to Timothy, a young bishop. He said, this know also that in the last days, how many of you know that we are living in the last days? Perilous times shall come, in other words, dangerous times. I mean, even as we look around this past week, we see where those two young men, I mean, they had a great future from, from what the news was saying uh, concerning, their, concerning their state in life. They had a great future ahead of them. And we don't really know what got into their mind, but the Bible said we're living in some dangerous times. I mean, it wasn't, don't seem to be nothing that they had against the government or some cooperation, but just set a bomb in, in the midst of innocent people. Just men and lives destroyed. I mean, even uh, understand that the, the young man that set one of the bombs right in front, I think it was an eight-year-old child, and just walked away, knowing that this bomb was going to blow this little kid to bits, probably. People lost limbs, just innocent people going on about their daily duties. So Paul said, we're living in some dangerous times. He said, for men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous, bolsters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Even in this same situation, I mean, they, they was talking to this, those young men's father, he, he, he just couldn't believe that his kids that came from his own body that he raised to be good citizens, he couldn't believe that they would do such act. I mean, even after all this stuff is on the news, even, even after they're showing them on the news, walking with the bums on their back, he said, somebody frame my kids. Otherwise, he just couldn't believe it. And their aunt, 
I heard her speaking. She says, well, show me the proof. Because she just couldn't believe. I mean, we are, li we are living in a time that people are doing things that is just past beyond understanding. She just really couldn't believe that her nephews would do such a. Even after looking at, she could see it on, on the screen that they are fighting against the cops. I mean, they are, they are in, a, in, a, in, a, in a gun battle. And she said, still show me the proof that they did it. In other words, that's the kind of generation that we are living in. In other words, it said covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. We're living in a generation now that people don't thank God for what he's done for them. I remember the time when we used to see tragedies happen in big masses and you will see the survivor, they say, well, I might have lost everything, but thanks be to God, I'm still here. I can start over, over again. But now you see all these tragedies happen, you don't hardly hear anybody saying, thanks be to God that I'm still alive. Why? Because people are unthankful these days. But how many of you glad that you're in the house of God and you know that and realize that everything that you have, even your very life, even the breath that you're breathing right now, comes from the hand of God. Somebody ought to give him a praise and a thanks right now in his house. Somebody ought to show God that you're grateful that you're yet in the land of the living. Somebody ought to give God a praise right now because you have a voice that you can lift up and say hallelujah. Somebody ought to give him a praise. Verse 3, it says, without natural affection. In other words, people don't have, they don't have, they don't have feelings like they should have feelings. In other words, it's unnatural. We see people doing things that's unnatural today. We, we wonder, I mean, we have a sane mind, wonder what's going on in their mind. They say, uh, don't have natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce. In other words, people are just angry. I remember the time you could be in traffic, you pull up behind somebody, perhaps they are listening at the radio, trying to tune into another station, and they don't see the light change, you can kind of toot your horn. I mean, if they didn't hear you, kind of lay on the horn, but my friend, you better not do that today. Because you're dealing with an angry generation. If you get behind somebody, and, they, and the light change and, and they don't pull off right away, my friend, it's best for you to start praying instead of you laying on that home. Because they are subject to get out of that car. You could be near the police station. They don't care. They just fear us. They'll get out and blow your brains out just for blowing your horn at them. That's the kind of generation that we are living in today. The spies are of those that are good. I mean, we got to, so, I mean, we, we as apostolics, we don't have to get out and demonstrate because we got prayer. How many of you know that prayer changes things? But we got the so-called Christian world, praise God, and we thank God for them. We got them, they get out and demonstrate against these abortionists. They get out and demonstrate against these people that want to do all this immorality, those that want to break God's law. And the people call them the scum of the earth. In other words, these people that they just God haters. So anybody that take a stand for the law, they call them the scum of the earth. In other words, they're saying you shouldn't even be here on earth. Praise God. That's the kind of generation that we are living in. Verse 5 says they have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. These same people, if you would talk to them, they say, yeah, I love Jesus. I love God. But what God is saying to them, he says, many people say with their mouth how much they love me, but their heart is far from me. So now that's the kind of generation that we are dealing with, my friend. Say so having a foam of garlands. Oh, yeah, they go to church sometime, but they deny the power. Somebody said power. How many of you know if you're really going to serve God, you need to have power of the Holy Ghost? Otherwise, you can't serve God unless you have the power of the Holy Ghost dwelling deep down on the inside of you. So they have a form of God. They look churchy. 
They look holy, my friend, but after you talk with them a while, after you be around with them a while, you'll see that they are nothing but just a rank sinner because a sinner is going to do what a sinner do. How many of you know that sinner sin? I said, how many of you know that sinner sin? Oh, yeah, you know, and I know because we used to be sinners, but thanks be to God that one day we was washed one day we was cleansed from all our sin. Is anybody in the house glad about it? But the Bible says, such was some of you, but thanks be to Jesus. Somebody said, thank you, Jesus. So they have a form of godliness. He said, but they deny the power thereof. And what God is saying to you and I, he says, from such, turn away. In other words, God said, don't be no bosom buddies with them. Don't hang out with them, even though you might have to work with them on your job. But don't have fellowship. The Bible tells us don't have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. How many of you know that birds of a feather flock together? In the word of God, so how can two walk together except they agree? You know, I love everybody, but I just don't hang out with everybody. You know, I respect everybody, but I just don't hang out with everybody. I have to hang out with those that are sanctified. He said the birds, like the old song said, the birds of a feather flock together. How can two walk together except they agree? I mean, I got to walk with somebody that love to talk about Jesus. Love to talk about the things of God. I mean, I ain't got time to talk about all, all the things that's happening in the world because the world is going to pass away in everything that's in it. So we just sold out to Jesus. So all those that just want to play church, what I'm getting out of this word, it said, don't have nothing to do with them. Now we can pray for them. We can love them. But after that, just keep on trucking for Jesus. Don't have no fellowship with them. Matthew 24 and verse 12 and said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure it unto the end, the same shall be saved. So he that endure it to the end, the same shall be saved. For this battle, my friend, is not given to the swift, not to the strong, but he that endure it to the end, the same shall be saved. So in other words, we're living in a time now that it's testing time, my friend, to see whose side are you on. The world has become anti-God. They don't want to have God, they don't want to have nothing to do with God and don't want God to interfere in their affairs. Some of your friends you've been hanging out with are going to soon start coming out of the closet. Some of those athletes that you've been cheering for going to start coming out of the closet. Some of, even some of your relatives that you was always kind of skeptical about anyway going to start coming out of the closet. And what are you going to do, my friend? Whose side are you on? We're living in a day that men are calling right wrong and wrong right. Otherwise, their mind is twisted. Can you imagine... Uh, I mean, to me, I can imagine nothing in their mind is going on but a whole bunch of spider webs just twisted up with a bunch of trash in it. I mean, because the decision that they are making, calling right and wrong and wrong right. So now the line is drawn in the sand, the test to see whose side are you on. That's the question I have for you today, my friend. Everyone that's under the sound of my voice, whether by internet about in this building, whose side are you on? Are you going to take a stand for the word of God? Or you will compromise, or will you compromise with the world? Joshua, even in this day, had to challenge God's people to make a decision as to whose side they were on. Joshua 24 and verse 14, Joshua began to talk to the people of God. After all God had done for them, how he brought them through the Red Sea. How he fed them with manna from on high. 
how he made ways for them when there seemed to be no way, how he promised to give them land that was flowing with milk and honey, yet in their mind they couldn't really decide that they really want to serve God or not. So now Joshua is challenging them. He says in verse 14, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in, in truth. How many of you know that you have to be sincere with God? How many of you know that you have to have a pure heart and a true heart before the Lord? Because the Lord says men are looking on the outward appearance, but God says I'm looking in the depths of your heart. You can say with your mouth how much you love me, but I'm looking deep down in your heart to see if there's any sincerity there. So he said you must serve the Lord in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seemed even unto you, verse 15, to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. And that's what I'm saying to everyone under the sound of my voice today. We are living in a world that's anti-God. So you got to choose you, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, because you never know when Jesus is going to come on the scene. You need to choose this day. Somebody said this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your father will serve, will serve on the other side of the flood, or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But I love what Joshua would say he hadn't made up in his mind. He said, but as for me in my house, look at your neighbors and neighbor, I don't know what you're going to do. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. I don't know what you are contemplating in your mind. I don't know what decision you are going to make in these last days. I don't know how your mind is functioning. But as for me in my house, we will serve the Lord. My friend, you got to have a made up mind. That means whatever the word of God says, that's what I believe. No compromising, no backing down, not going to even discuss the matter. If God said it, I believe it, and that sells it. That's the kind of mind you got to have, my friend, because the only way you'll have a mind like that, you got to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You, the Bible said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. And Jesus had a mind at all times to please the Father. How many of you want to please him today? How many of you want to live for him today? How many of you are going to make that choice? For Jesus I live and for Jesus I die. Somebody give him a praise in the house. Somebody just bless his name for a little while. Somebody just give him some accolades in the house. Oh, clap your hand. Oh, ye people, and give our God a praise. So God is not going to change his word to please men. Men have to change their ways to please God. For Psalm 119 and 89 said, Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. In other words, from Genesis to Revelation, the word has already been spoken and is not going to be changed. How many of you glad that you are in the word and that the word is in you? I'm so glad, as I always say, that I'm wrapped up, tied up, and tangled up in the word of God. How many of you glad about it this morning? So that God that allows you to do whatever you choose to do, whatever satisfies your lustful desires, if it feels good, that's the world that we are living in, my friend, especially here in America, a, play, a country that used to love God, a country that trusted in God, but now they are putting God on the back burner. So they, 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 they coming up with the idea that if it feels good, then go ahead and do it. If it sounds good, then go ahead and try it. My friend, that's the God of this world. Somebody said, that's not our God. That's the God of this world. But the Bible says the devil is the God of this world. And if you follow the devil, he's just going to lead you straight to the lake of fire. Because the God that we serve is a holy God. Somebody said he's holy. I said the God that we serve 
as apostolic is a holy God. In order to walk with him, you have to be just like him. In order to be like him, you have to have his spirit down on the inside of you. The Holy Ghost dwelling on the inside of you will cause you to walk like he walked. First Peter, verse 1, chapter 1, verse 15 says, But as he which had called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. In other words, in your lifestyle, in your conduct. He said, you got to be holy. In verse Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says, holiness, somebody said holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. That simply means that if you don't have the Holy Ghost, somebody said Holy Ghost, you can kiss heaven goodbye. I say it again, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you can simply kiss heaven goodbye. My friend, it might be some sitting in here this morning, but I have good news. Somebody say good news. God wants to give you the Holy Ghost. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you might not have it, but God wants to give you the Holy Ghost. So today is your day. Today is your day that you might receive that power, that you might be endured with power from on high. Because I'm telling you, my friend, you're going to need power for the hour that we are living in. Luke chapter 11 verse 9 assures us that God wants to give you the Holy Ghost. Luke 11 and 9 it says, and I say unto you, this is Jesus talking, ask and it shall be given you, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone, somebody say everyone. Not some, God doesn't have respect or person, but everyone that asks it, receive it, and he that seek it, find it, and to him that knock it, it shall be open. Somebody say, it shall, not might, but it shall be open. He said, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give for a fish, him a serpent? Or if he shall ask for an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? This is what he said in verse 13. Jesus said, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? God wants you to have the Holy Ghost. He came and died that you might have the Holy Ghost. But there's three requirements that I want to bring to your attention in order to receive the Holy Ghost. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, listen attentive. Three requirements. First one is obedience. The next one is repentance. The next one is water baptism in Jesus' name. First of all, obedience. In Acts chapter 5, verse 32, it says, And we are his witnesses. This is the apostles talking. We are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. Now, if you don't obey the word of God, you can't receive the Holy Ghost, my friend. Maybe that preacher might have told you that, that church you've been going to, that radio pastor you've been listening at, that television ministry that you are, that you just love so much. Perhaps they told you all you have to do is just lift up your hand and repeat after me. Confess Christ with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and now you save. Write, write us or give us a phone call and be sure to send us a check. My friend, that won't get you the Holy Ghost. You have to be obedient to the word of God. Jesus said in St. John 17, when he, when he was getting ready to go back to heaven, he began to pray for his disciples. He says, Father, 
not only do I pray for these, but for all those that believe on me through their word. Somebody said through their word. You have to remember, my friend, that Jesus gave Peter the key. When he gave Peter the key, he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. My friend, brother, we have, well, I won't call no name, but we have some, some particular brothers that have keys to this building. And if you don't ask one of those brothers to open the door, you don't have a key, you can't get in here. Because if you break down the door, the alarm going to go off and you're going to get locked up before you get off the premises. So Peter had the key. Other words, what Jesus is saying, you can't get to heaven unless you come through what Peter had to say. How many of you glad about it this morning? How many of you glad about the apostles? How many of you glad about the word of God? How many of you believe the word of God this morning? So Peter had to keep my friend, and he began to open up the door on the day of Pentecost. In Acts 1 and 8, he said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin, and you shall. Somebody say, you shall. How many of you want that power this morning? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. How many of you glad about it this morning? I don't know about you, my friend, but 35 years ago, that was good news to my ears. You know what? Growing up, and especially as a teenager, I thought I had done heard some good things out in the world. I thought I had done read some good things. I thought I had heard some good music. But the day that I heard that I can receive the Holy Ghost, if only I repent of my sins, if I get baptized in Jesus' name, those were the sweetest words I ever heard in my life. I remember that was an old song that they used to sing in church when I was a kid. If the song says, I mean, those old, I wouldn't call them saints, but they was church goers. They were saying the song. They said, I was once was blind, but now I see. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Praise God. When I heard, when I got baptized in Jesus' name, that song began to play in my mind. I realized that I once was lost, but now I'm found. I realized that I once was blind, but now I see. How many of you know what I'm talking about this morning? Those that's been down in Jesus' name. Those that have their sins washed away. Those that's filled with the Holy Ghost. You ought to just stand up on your feet for just a little while and give him praise that do the praise. Somebody ought to thank God for the Holy Ghost. Somebody ought to thank God for the baptism in Jesus' name. Somebody ought to thank God for giving them the revelation of how to get from earth to glory. Is anybody glad about it in the house this morning? We'll give them a praise. Why don't you just take a little praise break and give our God a praise in his house this morning? I believe that he's worthy. Do we have anybody in the house believe that he's worthy? Do you know that he's really worthy to be praised? Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. For he's a good God. Somebody say he's a good God. So it's going to require obedience. Next, it's going to require repentance. That being a turning from sin to righteousness. Somebody, even in our midst this morning, you ought to be saying, even while this word is going forth, Lord, help me to turn. I mean, because if God don't help you, my friend, you'll never make it. The Bible says nobody come to Jesus unless the Father draw them. Somebody said, draw me, Lord. In other words, draw me close to my Savior. Draw me close to the cross because I don't want to leave this building today without being filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you need it this morning. Look at your neighbor again and say, neighbor, you can have it this morning. So you have to repent of your sins. Otherwise, turn from sin to righteousness. Second Corinthians 7 and 10 says, For God is sorrow, worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Otherwise, you got to be truly sorry for your sins. After hearing the word of God, you got to be truly sorry for your sins. Not the kind of sorrow that people say, you know, when they get out and do all these dirty deeds, 
politicians sometimes, preachers, sometimes businessmen get out and do all these dirty deeds and once they get caught, they say, I'm sorry. That's not true repentance. You just saying you're sorry because you got caught. But what God is saying, he wants true repentance. Otherwise, from the heart, you got to let God know, Lord, I'm sorry for my sins. You got to make a 180 degree turn, my friend. I've been living all my life for the devil, all my life for the world. But since I heard the word of God, I'm making a turn. Somebody said I'm making a turn. And I'm going to follow Jesus the rest of my days. And then it comes to water baptism. Mark 16 and 16. I know some of your radio preachers, some of your local preachers, they said, well, water baptism is not really necessary. They said, water baptism is just an outward show to show people that, well, you're joining the church. My friend, you can't join this church. You have to be born into this church. Jesus told Nicodemus in St. John 3 and 5, he said, except a man be born again of water and of the spirit, he cannot, somebody said, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. So otherwise, you got to be born again. So he says, he that believe in Mark 16 and 16, he that believe it, do we have any believers in the house this morning? He that believe it, and is baptized. Now that and is a conjunction, so you can't separate it from water baptism. He said, and is baptized, shall be saved. Not might be saved, but you shall be saved. But you got to first be what? Baptized in water, having your sins washed away. He that believe it not shall be down. So my friend, you could go ahead on and keep on believing those television evangelists that's stripping you for, you know what I got a little testimony on a praise break right here and I'm plus I'm not afraid to call the name I remember when I first got saved you know I mean it's in my heart like to give to the work of the Lord now I used to give my money to the club I mean they had some concerts in town I would give my money to the concerters I just spending my money in the world, but now I'm saved. So I just want to support the work of the Lord. How many of you know as a baby Christian, if you don't get taught, you really don't know what is the work of the Lord. What's the true work of the Lord? So now I'm a baby Christian, a baby saint. So I hear Jim Baker and Tammy Baker on radio with their program. I forget the name of it, but I remember their name. And so they appealing for money, just appealing for money. Oh, my heart. You know what? When you first get saved, you got a heart of giving. I don't know what happened to some of the saints after they get saved a while and come into the knowledge of the truth, then they get stingy. But, but you know what? I'm glad that spirits didn't get hold of me. But instead of giving to a false ministry, I just give to a good ministry now. But anyway, I wrote out a $100 check, sent to Jimmy Jim Baker and Tammy, and then all of a sudden, later on after they got caught in this scandal, the doghouse got gold plates in it. The doghouse got gold fossils and all this stuff. Man, I could have took that hundred dollars at least bought me some gold rims on my tie, Deacon. I bought one of my kids a gift. So you can keep on listening at all these false preachers telling you that you don't have to be baptized in water. But the word of God says, let God be true. Somebody said, let God be true. And every man, not some man that go against the word of God, but every man a liar. I mean, if he don't care if he got his collar turned backwards, don't care if he's driving a Rolls Royce, don't care if he got a penthouse, but if he don't believe water baptism in Jesus' name is the right way to get you to heaven, then he's a false prophet. So he that believe in and is baptized shall be saved. Power, we're talking about power for the hour this morning. So two main reasons, even though it might be more, but 
two main reasons why you need the Holy Ghost. In other words, the Holy Ghost will keep you in the hour of temptation. Now, I know we have some saints that, well, I'm just so strong, you know, that temptation don't bother me. Well, go ahead with your bad self. But the Holy Ghost will keep you in the hour of temptation. My friend, as long as you're in this body of flesh, because Paul said in this flesh, not the present flesh that's sitting next to you, but in your own flesh, he said, dwell in no good thing. I know we pumped it up this morning. We sprayed a little cologne and perfume and all that stuff on. But Paul said, in your flesh dwell in no good thing. Now don't get mad with me and get mad with Paul. Because I fit in that category too. So as long as you're in this world, you're going to be tempted with something to try to get you out of the will of God. It might be the lie. The devil back you up in a corner. And the only way you can see yourself getting out is tell that little white lie. But my friend, I'm here to tell you there's no such thing as a little white lie. A lie is a lie. And no liars are going to enter the kingdom of heaven. The devil's going to tempt you even to cheat sometime. You know what? If I, did, I mean, it's income tax time. Now, I know some of you have filed already, but I still got to say what the Holy Ghost want me to say. Some of you might even cheat just a little bit on your income tax that you can get more of that filthy lucre. Because if you don't get it the right way, that's all it is, filthy lucre. Listen to what the word of God says. If any man get any money by false accusation, it won't do you no good anyway. The devil, he's going to tempt you with fornication sometimes. I mean, you're not married. Oh, but she looks so good. I mean, you're, you're rubbing up a little too close to her. I mean, he's so handsome. And all the devil want to do is get you into fornication. But somebody said, thanks be to God for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> devil going to tempt you with a doctrine sometime. You know you're married, but you got those Roman eyes. I heard the Sunday school teacher said this morning, he quoted Job. Job says, I won't set none of that stuff before my eyes. You need to keep your eyes on the one that God gave you. Somebody go ahead and give him a praise in the house this morning. First Corinthians, thanks be to God for the Holy Ghost. First Corinthians 10, 13 says, there had no temptation taking you but such as is common to man but God somebody said but God who is faithful will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it somebody said thank you Jesus somebody said thank you Jesus because if it had not been but the Lord who was on my side when the devil came with all these temptations, he would have swallowed me up. But thanks be to God for Jesus. So the Holy Ghost, number two, is your passport to heaven. In other words, there's some countries you can't leave the United States and enter in unless you have a passport. So the Holy Ghost is your passport to heaven. When that trumpet sound and Jesus split those eastern skies and says, come up, my people, you're going to need the Holy Ghost as a rocket booster to get you out of here, my friend. Somebody said, thanks God for the Holy Ghost. First Thessalonians 4, 16 says, for the Lord himself, not Michael, not Gabriel, but the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, 
and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Is anybody glad about it this morning? Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back soon. He's coming back for a church without spot and wrinkle. And I don't know about you, my friend, but I'm so glad I don't have to get ready. But I'm so glad that I'm ready. I can say like John, even so come, Lord Jesus, get me out of here. For this world is not my home. I'm not attached to this world. But the word of God told me to wear this world like a loose garment. Because I might get out of here any time. Do we have any believers in the house this morning? Is anybody in the house ready to go back with Jesus? Are you so tied up in this world that you are saying, Lord, don't come now. Wait just a little while longer. But that's for me and my house. I said, that's for me and my house. That's for me and my house. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. Because I'm ready. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost, not just a trickle, not just a little bit, not just a little dab of do you, but I'm filled with the Holy Ghost from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. That's why the things I used to do, I, I, I don't do no more. The places I used to go, I, I don't go no more. The things I used to say, I don't say it anymore because Jesus. Somebody said Jesus. Jesus is a difference maker. He made a new thing in my life. So glad that I've been to the water. I've been baptized. I've been cleansed from all my sin. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I got joy unspeakable and full of glory. When you see me coming, when you see me laughing, I'm just happy about the Holy Ghost. Somebody give him a praise in the house. If you love him, give him a praise. If you save, give him a praise. If you have the Holy Ghost, give him a praise. The Holy Ghost is the difference maker. The Holy Ghost will take you from earth to glory. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody bless his name. And even if you have the Holy Ghost, how many of you know that you can get a double portion of the Holy Ghost? The apostles, when they raised this man, this, this, this man that was laid from his mother's womb, and the council, the Jewish council, begin to question him, begin to ridicule him, and say, how did you do it? They said, by the power of the Lord Jesus. So after they couldn't find no fault in them, they let them go to their own company. When they got with the rest of the saints, they begin to tell them all oh, what happened. Now the disciples begin to pray even though they was filled with the Holy Ghost, they begin to pray. And the Bible says, as they begin to pray, the whole place begin to shake. And they was all filled with the Holy Ghost all over again. Anybody in this house need a double portion of the Holy Ghost? The Holy Ghost will make you live right. The Holy Ghost will make you talk right. The Holy Ghost will make you stop lying. The Holy Ghost will make you stop cheating. The Holy Ghost will make you love your wife right. The Holy Ghost will make you love your husband right. Somebody say, Holy Ghost. Somebody say, I need it. Got to have it. Ah! Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Power for the hour. The day is your day. If you don't have it, my friend, you.
you don't have to leave here without it today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody bless him. Somebody give him praise. Somebody thank him for the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Power. You shall receive power. Doing the most power. Power to cast out devils. Power to bring demons down to their side. Holy Ghost. See, that's why the devil don't play around with me. I mean, the Bible says, he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know, he done already sought me and found out that I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Because I got power from on high. I heard our first lady the other night, she said, devil, give me your best shot. Give me your best shot. And when it's all over, I'll still be standing strong in the power of the Holy God. Somebody shout power. Hallelujah. 